but I think we're in an awful lot of trouble here, mainly because, you know, we haven't spent enough money in the last 15 years uh, on our energy supply. Our prediction is by 2040, uh, we will be producing meaningfully more oil than we are today. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. A month ago, energy analyst Doomberg published a report titled, Peak Cheap Oil is a Myth, and a few weeks back, I interviewed him about it. To say it ruffled feathers would be a huge understatement. Those in the peak cheap oil camp have clamored for a chance to respond to Doomberg's claims, and that's exactly what we're going to do here in this video. Today, Adam Rosenzweig, managing partner of Gehring and Rosenzweig, natural resource investors, sits down for a discussion with Doomberg, which will be moderated by yours truly, to debate, or better, to co-explore the question, when looking out at the next 50 years, is the threat of peak cheap oil fact or overblown fear? Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, same here, I must say. Uh, other than Corolla, I think I'm talking to two of my favorite Adams in the world. So it's going to be a, a fantastic discussion. <laughs> All right. We'll have to get uh, Adam Corolla on for the next one. Um, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. As I mentioned in the intro, um, a, a lot of interest was stirred up by your recent report, Doomberg. Um, when you and I had recorded our interview, um, you know, we had noted that there was probably going to be some response. Um, there certainly was. And we had talked about the idea of maybe bringing on somebody who could argue basically the other side of, of, of the story. And I remember at the time you said, wow, my preference for that would be Adam Rosenzweig. And I think like three or four hours after we said that, Adam actually reached out to you to say, hey, I'd actually like to talk about this. So it seemed like this discussion was written in the stars. Uh, again, a lot of people have been following this over the past couple of weeks. I'm so glad that you both agreed to sit down with us today and actually hash through this. Um, I've got a, a progression of questions I'd like to try to get through, but we'll let the conversation kind of go where it will. My hope is at the end of it, the audience has a very clear understanding of the points upon which you both agree and the areas in which you differ and where you differ, why you differ. So gentlemen, without further ado, let's, let's just jump right in. Um, and maybe we can do that by just defining for the audience a few things. Um, first off, uh, what is peak cheap oil and why are those who are concerned about it concerned about it? Adam, if we could start with you and, and let you just sort of set the, the table here with that answer. No, that sounds great. And look, you know, we're, I'm very excited to uh, be talking with both of you today. You know, Doomberg, we read all of your writings. We've spoken on a panel or two in the past as well. And we think that um, your work is very, very good. Uh, it's always easier to disagree with people that that you don't admire their work than to have a different opinion when you do admire their work. But I think today uh, it'll be exciting to go through some of the things that we agree on and some of the things that we have a little bit of a different approach on. Because ultimately, you know, we, there, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of commonality. But I think our conclusions are dramatically different. So it should make for a really interesting discussion. When we talk about peak oil and we talk about the end of peak cheap oil, uh, what we're really talking about are the work of King Hubbard. Um, and for those of you who are unaware, King Hubbard was a shell geologist uh, who was very prolific in the 1950s, and he made some very controversial claims in both uh, in his lifetime and then even after his death, um, his views and his research were, were always mired in controversy. So I think it's very fitting that here we are today talking and debating about these same issues that have been um, debated for quite some time. So I'm going to share my screen for a second here when we talk about uh, peak oil and peak cheap oil, because what we're really talking about, as I mentioned, are the works of uh, King Hubbard and peak oil. And there he is there. Um, and on the inset, you'll see what effectively was the culmination of a lot of his work. And that was to tie together the concept of reserves and production. Makes sense. It's simple on the face, but the idea that your total peak production rate of a field or of a given hydrocarbon basin would ultimately be determined by how much recoverable reserve was there. The bigger the field, the more it could produce, the higher the production rate, and the longer it could sustain that rate. And one of his views was that once half the reserves of a field had been produced, the field would then peak in its production and roll over. And using these theories and these um, these doctrines, King Hubbard got up in front of a 
meeting of the American Petroleum Institute in the late 1950s and made the prediction that by 1970, U.S. production, which to that point had been a big, big growth driver in global non-OPEC oil production and and global oil production uh, since this predates OPEC, um, would peak in 1970. Very controversial. And so what happened? Everyone waited with bated breath for the next 20 years or so. And sure enough, right on cue, 1971, oil production in the United States peaks and begins to roll over. And it rolls over all the way really until the late 2000s. By 2005, we saw another huge resurgence in the views and the research of King Hubbard and peak oil and Hubbard's peak and this type of stuff, uh, made famous by Matt Simmons, who wrote Twilight in the Desert, made famous by the oil drum and things of that nature. And it was becoming a Wall Street kind of obsession and favorite um, topic, which should always make anybody a little bit nervous because no sooner than everyone had sort of internalized peak oil, then this happened. The United States production all of a sudden started to grow. Not only did it grow, it surged. It went from about four and a half million barrels all the way up to 13 million barrels that we have today. The most unbelievable turnaround in the history of hydrocarbons. And why? Well, of course, it's because of the shales. But what goes much less discussed is the idea that if you look only at conventional production in the United States, meaning not shale production, you take out the shales, you'll see that in fact, for the last 12 years, post 2008, post 2009, US conventional production has continued to follow its Hubbard's curve. It's continued to decline and decline and decline. And what we've done is we filled in the shales right on top of that. Now there's no taking away the importance and the impacts of the shales in the last 15 years. They have been absolutely everything in global oil markets. But the real question I think before us today is here on the left, you have the conventional Hubbard peak for conventional US oil. And on the right, you have the shale production up until now. And the question is whether this will continue to grow, whether it will continue to provide ample growth to meet global demand and to meet declines elsewhere, or is what we're looking at here, the left-hand side of a secondary Hubbard curve. You treat almost the shales and the conventional independently. That's what we're talking about when we talk about peak oil is the idea of whether or not the shales will ultimately follow a lot of the same geological constraints and considerations as the conventional oil production in the United States has. And if it does, does that mean that this major growth driver, in fact, the only growth driver over the last 15 years is now potentially behind us. And in that type of a world, prices stay higher for longer. Uh, we end up in a very, very tight energy market. Um, and, and I think you have a very, very strong bull run for, for commodities and for energy going forward. Now, one thing we don't think peak oil and peak cheap oil is, and I just want to be clear on this, you know, we're not inherently Malthusian. We're not Cassandras that think the world is going to end. And in fact, there have been peak oil scares in the past and there have been, some have been right and some have been wrong, but ultimately I do think we resolve out of these situations over a long enough time period. I don't think we're going to go back to living in our pre-industrialized age, although Germany is trying to do that as we speak <laughs> now. Uh, but what I do think is that the era of abundant, cheap energy that we've enjoyed for the last 15 years, where we brought on 13 million barrels a day, effectively, of unexpected production is not going to be repeated in the next 15 or 20 years. And I think that we're going to have a very, very tight market because of that. All right. And Duberg, I'm going to give you a chance to respond in just a second. Um, a couple of quick questions for you, Adam. Um, First is, uh, I just want to underscore the point you just made. You're not predicting in any sort of way like a like a Mad Max or a world made by hand kind of dystopian future here where we kind of run out of energy. Um, you're just saying that for the reasons you, you just mentioned, uh, supply is going to get increasingly marginally harder and more expensive to extract. And that again, on the margin, oil will become more expensive uh, as we go into the future on average, correct? So we just have a little bit less available to us to drive our, our economy as time goes on. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I think if you want to take one step back, so yes, I think that's exactly right, Adam. I don't expect that we're going to go back to our Mad Max, not that we ever were in a Mad Max um, post-apocalyptic world, but I don't think that that's where we're headed. Uh, I think that our best days lie ahead of us, and I think our most energy abundant days lie ahead of us. But there's going to be major, major dislocation as we find ourselves in an energy constrained and an energy tight world. And I should point out, you know, everything in energy markets is all set on the marginal unit of supply and demand. So when we talk about surpluses, we're talking about a market that's never more than 1% in surplus, and a deficit that sees prices rise tenfold is never 
more than one or 2% in deficit. So everything's set on the margin. And I think on the margin in the last 15 years, you can safely say you've been running into additional supplies. It's been easier and easier and easier than anyone had expected in any given moment to bring on new productive capacity. And I think that's what's changing now. It's gonna become more and more and more and more difficult. So yes, the, the, the changes will feel subtle. They're not gonna run into a wall apocalyptically, but uh, for investors, for consumers, the price action could be quite dramatic. All right, and then one last question before we get to you, Duberg, and I know you're chomping at the bit. Um, you talked about King Hubbard's peak oil theory where conventional fields peak sort of on a bell curve, right? Um, then you showed how production took off when we tapped into shale. Um, shale wells, they don't really decline on a on a, a gradual bell curve like that, right? They tend to decline much more asymptotically. Is that accurate? So it is and it isn't. So yes, here you have some of the earliest shale fields, the Barnett, which exhibits a very, very, very um, interesting bell-shaped curve, much more than I think anyone had expected from a tight oil, uh, tight gas reserve, and the Fayetteville, which is even more so. Um, and he, I have a couple others in the Eagleford and the Bakken, which are a little bit noisier, largely due to, the, due to the effects of COVID. And here's the Permian. So the Permian is the big wild card. Will this end up looking like a bell-shaped curve or not? And I think that that is one of the most fascinating peculiarities and subtleties here with the shales is that, yeah, given the fact that they're completely different geologically, the fact that you're fracture stimulating rock that effectively has no porosity and no permeability and that you're introducing artificial stimulation you have these huge flush productions and then they've declined 90 percent yet the fields seem to exhibit exactly the same tendencies as a conventional oil field will and i do think that that's one of the most interesting nuances that very very few people appreciate so yeah the shale wells are completely different. They have completely different systems. They have different pathways and different matrix contrib contributions to production. And yet there they are. They, they seem to, at least for the earliest ones that have now been in production for about 10 or 12 years, generate a lot of the similar trends uh, that the conventional fields do. All right. Interesting. And I, I appreciate you clarifying that just because I know that some of the peak oil folks say, yeah, we're having this party in the shale right now, but it's going to disappear a lot faster because of the asymptotic nature. You're saying, well, so far, looking at the data, they seem to be following a similar bell curve. That's All right, exactly Duberg. right. Great. Thanks. Duberg, you've been very patient here. Let me give you a chance to just respond to, to Adam's opening there. You bet. <clears throat> and let me begin by um, reiterating what we said at the beginning. Very happy to be here. I really love Adam's work and the, the GNR team, and I read everything they put out as well. And um, I don't view today as, a, as an, you know, the objective is to be right. The objective is to learn uh, where the differences lie and then let the audience decide um, you know, in their own way uh, where they think the world is headed. So I would say that I agree with uh, almost everything that Adam just said, but I would point out a few um, inconvenient facts for the peak cheap oil crowd. And, and I would say that Adam's definition of peak cheap oil is a little more reasonable than some of the hyperbole that we see out there in the Twitter community in particular, and, and on some of the more um, less balanced YouTube channels um, than your show, for example, um, Adam Taggart. Um, Hubbard was largely correct about conventional oil production in the US, and it did peak in 1970, 1971. And I would point out that uh, integrated across the world, the globe was producing 48 million barrels a day of oil uh, in 1970. Now, the US, peaking in its production had huge ramifications for the world. Um, the U.S. ultimately removed itself from um, the gold standard. Um, I believe that the common belief in Washington, D.C. that the U.S. had, in fact, irreversibly confronted peak oil led to many of the disastrous foreign adventures that the country has embarked upon in the past 50 years. Um, and another thing, it's the, oil has the, the oil production of the world has basically doubled since then. So Hubbard was completely right about U.S. conventional oil production. And yet, on the larger picture, the picture that mattered to the global economy, um, peak cheap oil was nowhere in sight. Um, it is always the case that certain fields that are currently being exploited that account for the totality uh, or, or a, a significant portion of, of marginal production, they will eventually roll over. No, no oil field is inexhaustible. But for the reasons we articulated on our last appearance, Adam, I just think that to um, jump to the conclusion that an important contributor to today's energy mix is possibly going to roll over, that this signals a meaningful change in the long arc of oil production around the world, 
uh, is is an assumption that I think has proven wrong for the past 50 years, and we see nothing on the immediate horizon that would make us assume that would be the case today. One final data point. Um, if you could pull up the inflation-adjusted price of oil chart that I sent you, um, Adam. Uh, as um, Adam Rosenzweig correctly mentioned, the last time that we had such a mania around peak cheap oil and we reached the all-time high price, um, both nominally and adjusted for inflation, was in fact at the beginning of the global financial crisis. And since that time, we've added 20 million barrels a day of oil production and, and um, a, a huge amount of natural gas production around the world. Nobody would argue that the global financial crisis wasn't real, wasn't substantial, wasn't impactful, but measured over decades, it was essentially meaningless in the overall global production of primary energy units. And I would say that this chart that we've produced is very difficult for people in the peak cheap oil crowd to explain away. Um, this is the inflation adjusted price of oil using uh, the Bloomberg indices. And show me on the chart where peak cheap oil is being called um, by the markets. It, oil today is priced reasonably balanced. Um, and, and I should say, the inflation numbers used to create this chart are the official US government CPI statistics, which I think many in the peak cheap oil community would argue radically understate the inflation that we've all experienced. And so both can't be true, because if that's true, then oil is even cheaper on an inflation adjusted basis than this chart shows. And this is you know, a 40 year chart. Um, if we were truly on the edge of a tectonic shift in the production of primary energy, I just don't think that we would be seeing the prices we're currently seeing. Well, can, can I actually, cause I find that a really fascinating point, a couple of things that I would be interested to respond to. You know, if you look at that inflation adjusted oil price chart again, um, you know, the last time you had oil prices at these comparable levels was just as non-OPEC supply was slowing in 2005. And you did have that big run up to which would nominally make it $145 a barrel oil. And you did have major, major slowing in the non-OPEC oil supply base, which was saved really only by the completely unexpected ramp up uh, of the shales. And so, Doomberg, as you and I have talked about um, when we when we were chatting in the lead up to this call, you know, I think always and and forever in energy markets, the key is to be looking sort of a, trying your best to look around the next corner and see where uh, the next potential source of new supply will be, uh, because clearly in in our mind, we could talk all about the shales at great length. We've done a lot of work on the shales. I think the shales are and continue to be extremely misunderstood by many people in the market. And, and a good example of that is that most people now are talking about this surging supply in the fourth quarter of last year from the shales. It's just not in the data. I don't know where people are getting their numbers from. It's just frankly not in any of the official or in the well by well or in the public company data. So the shales continue to be really misunderstood. But you go back to 1970 and you go back to 2005, and there was a huge amount of ingenuity. There was a huge amount of engineering prowess being put to work in the oil patch. Um, and yet that didn't stop oil prices from 1970 effectively going up 11 fold from $3 to $35. And in 2000 to 2005, going from $11 to $145. Uh, th there was a huge amount of effort looking for the next field. There's a huge amount of effort trying to develop new production to, as you said, counteract the depletion of a major source of existing supply. But in 1970, it wasn't enough to overcome the slowing of the major source of Western world oil supply, which was the United States, and nothing could really overcome that. And that's why prices ended up rallying 11 fold. And in 2005, as the non OPEC block in general was beginning to slow, prices again, started to move up again on a factor of, of about 10 as OPEC began to gain pricing power and market share. Since 2010, there's been no such tensions at all, because as you rightly mentioned, the US has basically brought on, when you include NGLs, which I know is a whole other point in this conversation, you basically brought on 20 million barrels of oil from, from the shale. So we have been running into oil for the last 15 years, and that's why prices have been weak, and that's why prices, as you rightly point out on an inflation adjusted basis remain weak but if we start to get that first derivative inflection where the sort where the rate of change of the growth begins to turn negative production peaks and rolls over in the shales the only source of growth i think that 
that begins to undo that. OPEC begins to gain market share, pricing power, and you have a totally new regime for until you bring on a new source of supply, which right now is unclear where it'll come from. And um, Adam, if I may, um, I agree with almost everything you just said, and I think this is an important point um, to, to draw out. Um, the crises that followed the peaking of US production in the 1970s, or the crisis that led to the global financial crisis in the mid to, mid to late 2000s, um, were not episodes of peak cheap oil. They were precursors to a period of relative energy shortage that led to massive moves in the price of oil. And if that were to happen today, which we freely admit is entirely possible, our argument is that would not constitute peak cheap oil. It would constitute a temporary crisis of energy shortage that would very quickly, as it has always done, um, be corrected uh, initially by destruction of demand and economic contraction, but eventually by the deployment of new technology, the loosening of politics, um, the widening of the definition of oil, um, and so on, such that the long-term price of oil will regress to the historical mean. And so I don't think we're actually disagreeing on the main point. I, I, I readily admit that we are currently in a period of relative energy excess, driven predominantly by marginal production in the shale patch. And if that were to change on a time frame that makes it difficult for the rest of the world to step up supply or to wipe away political constraints or to implement new technologies, we would certainly be in a multi-year energy bull market. But our view is that is very far away from calling the long-term top of peak cheap oil. And our prediction is by 2040, uh, we will be producing meaningfully more oil than we are today. The path function from here to there might be rocky. Some people might make a lot of money. Some people might lose a lot of money. But the long arc of the human endeavor is we grind out more primary energy every year, not less. And we see nothing on the horizon that would substantially change that. And final point is if we were having this discussion in 2008, during the mania, the Simmons famous bet that we described in our piece, none of us would have any idea that shale was on the horizon and would have the impact that it did, which basically just says we don't know um, what it will be that saves humanity uh, from peak cheap oil, but it'll be something. We have some thoughts, which we can get into, but um, I, I would say, sure, uh, we could have a meaningful crisis, and I guess it comes down to a matter of degree. How big of a crisis would we need to see in the next, say, two to three years for the Doomberg side to tip the hat and say, yep, uh, you know, for practical purpose, we were, we were wrong in our analysis um, or vice versa. Like how small a crisis would um, the peachy ball crowd have to see before production rebounded in, in, in a variety of ways before they would say, yeah, okay, maybe we've still got 20, 30, 40, 50 years to go uh, on this incredible journey. Well, and I suppose, you know, that's where ultimately we, we find our greatest point of overlap and our greatest point uh, of divergence. I, I also believe that human ingenuity and engineers will find a way through this and will our best days lie ahead of us from both an energy consumption perspective uh, and from a GDP and an economic development perspective. I suppose using the past cycles as a interesting point of reference in history, um, if you could, if you think, you know, you, you take the minus $40 print that we had in the heart of COVID, you call $20 a reasonable low for this cycle. And you know, 27 was the low made in 16. And then you basically had a couple months of 20 bucks through COVID as well. So let's call 20 the cycle low. And if you rose 11 fold off of 20 to $220 in this cycle because of a supply issue, and the inability to meaningfully bring on new production to be able to meet global demand growth and or uh, a period of curtailment from OPEC because of their feeling that they had retained pricing power and market share. Uh, I would consider that an energy tight market. I would consider that a market of which we are not awash in oil, of which we're not readily running into new supplies. And whether or not you ring the bell and call it the top of peak cheap oil, I think with crude at $200, there's probably a little victory lap that comes from the folks that we're calling for some type of a peak oil. And, and this is where definitions can get confounded yeah. and, and mixed up. And to some extent, it, it makes all the difference is how you define these things. And to some extent, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, it when you see it. Um, so I think if we get if we get a price spike, if we move forward, if there's a feeling that it's very difficult to bring on the marginal barrel of supply, if inventories continue to trend 
lower, uh, then I do think that that the peak cheap oil people, at least the more moderates, uh, could put a little feather uh, in their cap. <laughs> 50 years from now, um, I bet we are producing, we're certainly producing more energy. Of that, I have absolutely no doubt. I tend to think we're probably going to be producing more oil as well, mostly because it's the most efficient form, ab absent nuclear, uh, of energy that we can meaningfully harness uh, and and use. And so, um, yeah, I think that prices will send the right signal. I think that engineers will do their thing. Uh, and I think we'll probably will resolve in 30 years from now with production, I would suspect, a little bit higher than we are today. Let me let me clarify a couple of things, but let me let me dig into that point you just made for a second, Adam. So if, if, um, if we're talking about peak cheap oil, but you're kind of agreeing that in 50 years or so, if we're using that as the timeline here, that we're going to be producing more oil. And, uh, you know, you've said our better days are ahead of us. How worried are you about, about that? It didn't, that, that, I think a lot of people are going to say, well, wait a minute, I was kind of thinking we'd have less oil or at least, you know, much more expensive oil and that would be shrinking GDP or, or at least preventing GDP from, from rising much. Um, well, I do think it's going to be, much, I do think it's going to be much more expensive. And I think if you look at right now what the resource and the reserve of the world is, is today, it, it doesn't immediately jump out at you where you're going to boost production above where we are today at 102 million barrels per day. Maybe you get to 103, 104, 105. But absent major new discoveries, of which we have had scant few over the last 10 or 15 years, and absent the exporting of the U.S. shale technologies to the rest of the world, which is a wonderful point that I think we need to discuss at length, uh, it doesn't really immediately jump out. You can't put your finger and say, okay, I see exactly here the pathway to where we're going to get to 120. Does that mean you can't get to 120 barrels a day? Absolutely not. However, it probably does mean that you need to use the price mechanism to incentivize new investment and a new price cycle coming. And in that environment, you know, particularly as investors, in that environment, that's effectively what we're looking for. Um, I'm and I'm a total optimist. I don't think you can be an investor in, in equities without being a, a long-term optimist. Certainly, history is not on your side if you're not a long-term optimist. And I think uh, our best days are ahead of us because we're going to continue, as Doomberg said, to grind out year after year additional sources of energy, whether they're cheap, whether they're expensive remains to be seen. And I think it's going to be put towards productive economic output because at the end of the day, GDP is effectively just a different way of talking about energy. And so do you think you're going to produce more energy going forward? Well, that asks, do you think the world is going to grow? And I think, of course, the world will continue to grow. It's going to be harder and harder to find oil on the marginal barrel uh, of, of supply versus demand. I think things are looking tough. And I think, unfortunately, in this cycle, what I do, what I am a little bit pessimistic about is that I do think when I look at what's going to end a bull run in crude, which is something I think is very important to look at any commodity that we look at, I don't think it's going to be, as of right now, new supply that comes on and overwhelms this market. I think it's going to be demand destruction. I think it's going to be high prices that squeeze out the incremental barrel of demand for this cycle. And so I think that there's a period of time here where we need to work through. I think there's a period of time where prices move a lot higher. And I think there's a period of time where investors are going to be rewarded amply and richly for being involved in energy stocks and particularly oil stocks. All right, great. And again, I'm just trying to, to zero in on, on really where the points of difference are here, because um, I believe both both you think there are cycles here where over the next couple of decades, there's going to be price spikes, there's going to be lows in price as well. Um, Doomberg, if I remember correctly from our previous interview, you basically said over the next 50 years, you sort of expect oil supply to increase on average about 2% a year. Um, so um, sure. and that it would it would on average sort of remain in the inflation adjusted price band that, that we currently are in right now. Right. You don't see like a secularly higher real price of oil, you know, as we head off into the future. Adam, I think that's where you disagree. Right. It sounds like you think that, that on, a, on a real inflation basis, adjusted basis, the, the price of oil is going to grind higher. How about to Doomberg's two percent per annum, you know, supply well, prediction? Can I, can I just give one point of reference here? It's probably integrated across oil and natural gas. Natural gas is growing at 2.5% CAGR since 1998, almost in a straight line. And oil is probably closer to between you know 1 and 1.5. One and but integrated over the hydrocarbons, um, we are grinding out at about 2% a year. So before Adam jumped in, I just wanted to make sure that I clarified the numerical references I was making in my own head last time we talked, Adam. 
Great, thanks. And I, I want to get in a second to just sort of make sure we agree on a definition of what is oil, because Doomberg, I know you have a, a bit of a different uh, uh, descriptor of it than, than maybe a lot of the peak oil folks do. But Adam, did I describe it correctly where you, you differ on kind of the price direction, obviously? Do you think his supply prediction is because 2% per annum compounds, you know, over 50 years? Uh, do you think that's too rosy or, or could that or do you think you get more aligned there than maybe I imagined? I, I think looking at it right now, that might be a little bit rosy, you know, with the caveat, just like Doomberg puts out his caveat that we're only a geopolitical event away from a crisis. I would put out the caveat that um, you, you can't, it's difficult to try to look around the corner to find the next undiscovered uh, potential field. But as of right now, it looks as though we're going to enter into 2024 with likely declines across the shale basins, likely declines in the rest of the non-OPEC world. And so if I'm looking at the market for the next five to 10 years, which is sort of our investment time horizon, the main source of new supply is probably going to be the deep water. And can the deep water provide 2 million barrels per day per year of net growth uh, in order to hit that 2% number? Uh, that, seemed, that seemed high to me. Um, and I know I know they're making distinctions between natural gas and oil, but actually we think that a lot of the depletion that's taking place in crude oil is actually taking place in in, in natural gas as well, which which is even a more controversial uh, comment because even the peak oil guys think we have as much <laughs> gas as we need, um, and, but we're we're not so sure. So I think I think two percent is probably too rosy uh, based on how we see things now. Yeah. So Adam, okay, can, great. I, can I respond to a couple of the points that um, Adam has made? Absolutely. Just to let you guys know what what I, what I do want to get to relatively soon is, is your sure. outlooks for supply and demand. Um, but before we get to there, I do want you to give your definition of, of what oil is, Doomberg, just in sure. case if Adam has a, a difference of opinion, we can get that sure. on the table first too. But yes, go yeah, respond so to it. A, a quick response to um, the last couple of points that Adam has made about where the new supply is going to come from, and then we could shift to the definition of oil. Um, and its uses and how there are other alternatives that smart engineers will implement in the face of $200 oil. I will say, I think $200 oil in the next five years is totally possible. And I just don't think that would mark peak cheap oil. Um, but where would the price of oil be today if we weren't engaged in a proxy war with the world's most important energy exporter, Russia? Where would the price of oil be today if we didn't have a kinetic conflict that we are basically directly involved in, in the heart of the Middle East? Where would the price of oil be today if Venezuela hadn't lost 3 million barrels a day of production because of political chaos? I don't think anybody would argue that the decline in Venezuelan oil production has anything to do with geology. Um, where would the price of oil be if the discovery of oil offshore in Guyana was used as a catalyst to um, develop a more productive relationship with Venezuela in a way that allowed Guyana's resources to be developed and Venezuela's resources to um, recover. Um, we could talk about Mexico. We could talk about political leadership changes in Canada, leading to, uh, leading to perhaps um, further exploitation of, of the tar sands in Alberta. Um, where would the price of oil be if OPEC hadn't voluntarily cut 2 million barrels a day of production? Um, where will the price of oil be if the, the shale resources in Russia and Argentina and, and even China um, eventually get properly exploited? I mean, I think there's all manner of relatively low barrier changes to the way the world currently operates that could very well bridge us for the next five to 10 years, even in the face of a relatively unexpected slowdown uh, in the shale patch. That's, that's our base case. Um, if, you, if you want, I could pivot to, the, to what we think oil should be defined as, but maybe uh, you could set it up with a question first. Well, and, 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 and Duberg, I just want to say one thing to that because I, I find that's a fascinating set of comments. And, and I agree with you that when you do look through 2023 and into 2024, I do agree that I would have expected a, a dust up um, in, in Europe and a major conflict in the Middle East. Dust up is obviously a bit of a, a, a glib term, but you know, ma major kinetic war, like you said, in both continental Europe and uh, in the Middle East to have elicited a higher price. And, and I do find that a little bit uh, curious to say the least uh, when when i look at some of the releases from the spr through 2022 2023 i think i can understand some of what was being glossed over with the russian ukrainian conflict and i think just the unbelievable bearish sentiment in the fourth quarter but the problem with counterfactuals you know is that they're kind of difficult to 
argue against and they're kind of difficult to see the other side of. And so what I would propose back to you is, you know, where would oil prices be if we hadn't brought on nearly 20 million barrels of unexpected new supply, 20 percent of global oil production from from the U.S. Uh, back in 2010? I mean, we we no one had that in their models. George Mitchell and Mitchell Energy was sort of down to his last dollar. Uh, Having, having gone broke trying and trying and trying in a, in a way that only American ingenuity allows for. Uh, and finally, in, in sort of his last gasp effort, was able to make horizontal drilling and hydrological fracturing work. Um, and, and yet here we are today still with oil basically in its long term, as you mentioned, inflation adjusted range. What happens if we lose that source of growth, which I believe is very, very likely based on the reserves of these massive fields that have been huge contributors, but are ultimately finite uh, in nature. And the same thing is true in gas. I mean, gas is just astounding when you kind of think of the counterfactual. I remember back in 2009, and this may be a good segue into talking about uh, what makes for oil and different forms of hydrocarbons. But all the way back in 2009, we had Wood Mac in our office, they're a big energy consultant firm, and they were talking about the LNG market. We were really bullish on LNG, and they were super bearish on LNG at the time. And the reason they were so bearish on LNG was that Qatar was about to ramp up their major new RAS gas three or RAS gas four, whatever it was. And this would be a huge new source of LNG onto the world stage, and it was going to massively, massively overwhelm supply demand balances, and prices would fall effectively to zero to the marginal cost of supply, which was. Qatari gas, effectively free feedstock, and just the cost to ship it. This was such a pervasive view that, of course, the United States actually built a massive import terminal to try to soak up all this free gas that would be floating on the water come, come summertime, um, because we were the only country in the world that had salt dome storages. Okay, So how can you measure whether gas, LNG on the water is cheap or not? The conventional wisdom is you look at its parity to crude oil, six to one plus transportation. If it holds its oil link price, that's a view that that the LNG market's pretty tight, it's trading up to its oil premium. Otherwise, if it's a wash, then it'll break that price. So from 2010, what has happened? Well, not only did all the Qatari gas come on, not only did they doubly expand their LNG exports, but the world's biggest importer, the United States became the world's biggest exporter. So you had a double order of magnitude swing. The world's biggest importer shut off and a new world's biggest exporter was crowned. And yet LNG over that entire time held its oil link price. There's a few exceptions based on weather, but for the most part, and here we are today, continues to hold its LNG price. And so some of these counterfactuals are a little bit difficult. Like, like where would LNG prices be if the United States was still importing you know, six or seven BCF a day instead of exporting 13 or 14. Um, that's the huge contribution that these shells have brought to the world. And the fact that they're potentially beginning to slow, I think has to be, if the shales were the most important oil story of the last 15 years, the slowing of the shale, I worry, will be the most important oil story and gas story of the next. Um, all right, well, look, that, that raises, again, some supply questions that I, I want to get to in terms of your outlooks, um, you know, one being the shale basins that you're largely referencing there, Adam, um, are ones in the U.S., right? So one, one big question is, is, are there geologies elsewhere in the world that, that could potentially be exploited? Before we get to that, Doomberg, because I just want to make sure that you guys are agreeing when you say the word oil, <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Doomberg, can you give your definition of oil? And Adam, if, if you want to react sure. to that in any way, that'd be great. So I, I think this is an important point and one that I think ruffled a few feathers and um, a few loud voices out there are misconstruing what we said and, and certainly what we meant um, when we said it on your show, um, perhaps having not read what we actually wrote uh, in our pieces. And one of the sayings that we have around here is we're always happy to defend what we, what we wrote, but not what you think you read, um, because sometimes, amazingly, mm -hmm. they can be um, very different things. Um, if you want to understand what the proper definition of oil is, the first thing you have to understand is what is it used for. And in the vast majority of use cases, setting aside the 6 or 7% that is transformed into chemicals, um, oil is burned in engines to do work. Um, that's a very broad definition of oil. But um, And right now, um, the world has billions of machines and engines that burn oil to do work. And those machines are tuned to receive um, certain refined products. So a diesel engine can't run on gasoline and a gasoline engine can't run on diesel and so on. Um, and so our refinery network, the global refinery network, its job is to convert hydrocarbons into those 
well-specified products. And so for today, our definition of oil is any hydrocarbon that finds its way into a refinery. And I think um, as refineries become more flexible, chemists and chemical engineers work their magic. Um, when feedstocks are abundant because no refinery could really use them, um, inventions and investments are made in order to, to close that molecular arbitrage. Uh, you know, if heavy oil is plentiful, um, what you see is refineries invest in sulfur removal technologies where they might not have had to do so before because they were you know, built to handle light sweet crude and so on. And over time, as refineries become more flexible, the variety of hydrocarbons that can find their way in either directly or through blending um, to displace what traditional crude oil um, had provided the market, um, the definition of oil necessarily must broaden. And so it's interesting that Adam bifurcated the conventional oil and the shale oil um, as though they were meaningfully different. But I would argue that as refineries become more flexible and can adapt to the molecular arbitrage on offer as you know, abundant feedstocks are cheap and, and feedstocks everyone can already refine today get more expensive, um, those things tend to converge over time. Now, over the long run, we have a whole other um, handle we could pull, which is something we're publishing on tomorrow, which will be out before this podcast publishes, I suspect, which is you could just change the engines. And in fact, you could run most of the engines on natural gas directly. Um, we could run cars on natural gas. We could run long haul trucks. We could run um, mining equipment, egg equipment. We can even run um, um, cargo shipping uh, vessels on, on natural gas if we had to. Now that would, in, that would involve some financial investment. Um, but as long as natural gas is cheaper than refined products, uh, you could skip the refinery step and just use natural gas directly. And, and in the U.S., where we have an unexpected glut at you know two dollars and thirty-five cents as we're recording this podcast uh, per million BTU, I mean a, a million BTU of natural gas in the U.S. costs less than a six-pack of nuggets at McDonald's. Uh, it would get put to use. People would change their engines and run their cars and their trucks uh, on natural gas in a true crisis if we did see. $250, $300, $500 oil, like some people predict. The more violent the crisis, in our view, the quicker the snapback. And that means that in the longest of long terms, um, all hydrocarbons will be oiled and they will effectively trade for the same price. That is the ultimate endpoint of the deflationary machine that is modern technology. All right. <laughs> that is a pretty bold stake in the ground in terms of what oil is. I'm curious, Adam. Do you agree, strongly disagree? What, what's your reaction? No, I, it's funny. You know, I, I don't find it to be that bold of, of, of a commentary uh, at all. I mean, to the extent, you know, nobody consumes crude oil in, in an explicit sense, I suppose, other than if you're a refinery. But when somebody says, okay, Doomberg, okay, Adam, what's your per capita oil consumption? I mean, I don't know what you guys are doing Um with it, but for the most part, what you're consuming is vehicle miles traveled in a car. And so I completely agree that what we're looking at is the inherent energy uh, in any of these fuels. And when you, there, there are certain physical properties like the fact that hydro, that crude oil, typically considered crude oil, you know, liquid crude oil, um, has a certain amount of methane, a certain amount of various other hydrocarbons and tends to be a liquid of, of a various range of viscosities at room temperature. But other than that, what we're really getting after is the underlying energy that's contained in it. To some extent, I think it's a little bit of a moot point because you do need to consider all the various sources of energy. And, and I don't think that we look at oil in a complete isolation from natural gas. And in fact, a lot of the trends that we see taking place and sort of peaking out of uh, shale resources and crude oil is actually also taking place in gas. And actually, if you really want to look at it, the, the two fields that have had the biggest, most pronounced Hubbard style rollovers have been shale gas fields, not shale oil fields. So they're definitely subject to the same uh, limitations. Now, one distinction though, that I think is really important to make um, is that while we have a degree of flexibility and while we can change crude slates or we can add byproducts or we can start to strip out NGLs from liquids rich streams and begin to reprocess them and the refining system is this unbelievable optimizer that kind of sits in the middle of the value chain and of the supply chain while that's all true I think we effectively need to or at least you can Doomberg agree or disagree with me that there's kind of two distinctions here uh, in my mind because I was thinking about it as you were talking how to really frame 
frame this. Um, you know, the one would be if we ran into a new source of hydrocarbon. Let's say we found uh, a new shale oil field or a new shale gas field, uh, and it had various properties, right, that were not exactly uh, uh, consistent or conforming with the current refining slate and the refining uh, complexities, meaning the refiners couldn't easily take that new source of oil or that new source of gas. Well, ultimately, what that would do over a fairly short term, we can argue what the exact short term is, but a fairly short term, what you would end up with was a system in which that new source of energy, which was very, very efficient because it's a new you know, virgin field producing at really flush rates, would find its way into the system through tweaks and through engineering uh, changes to allow for that. And ultimately, it probably would end up in greater than trend economic growth to effectively use that new source of energy. That would be kind of one side of the, of, of the equation. And I think that's kind of the world that you're envisioning here, where we're broadening our scope. Engineering acumen is allowing us to now treat NGLs, gas, oil as not quite fungible, but nearly fungible. And that, it, as you put it, at the end of this deflationary path, you'll have complete energy parity because we'll have abundance throughout the different supply chains and the ability to go back and forth. And I would say you got to compare and contrast that with a, actually a lot of the historical precedent of things like gas to liquids. Uh, and, and, you know, as we have discussed in the past, gas to liquids was really engineered first uh, in Germany during World War II as a solution to get around the fact that they didn't have ready available supplies of crude oil to make for aviation fuel. And then secondly, in South Africa, as an attempt to <clears throat> get around apartheid state sanctions and inabilities to access uh, global energy markets from a crude basis. And in that case, what you're doing is you're turning, in the case of South Africa, coal, but you could turn natural gas or coal into a synthetic uh, gasoline. So that kind of fits your bill too, right? That over time, we'll be able to get what we need through the system. But that's inherently done from a position of scarcity because you have to, with very poor energy efficiency and very poor energetics, versus we're running into huge new supplies of feedstock, we're awash in a new super light condensate. And so we're going to change the slates to be able to accommodate that. I see us more going uh, in the in the in the first example that I gave you know, the, the sort of Germany, South Africa example, where uh, we're coming at it from a position of supply scarcity, and we do what we have to do to get what we need. But to me, that's inherently inflationary, uh, as opposed to I think your view of the world where we have this expanded view, because we're just awash in everything, and we need the flexibility to go back and forth. And we have a culmination of a deflationary event uh, in energy. So I think I think the the logic's the same, but again, the outcome's really really different because I just don't think that we're running into molecules anymore. So let me give you a um, a standard debate tactic, which is a yes and. So I actually agree with everything that you said, and those two examples from history are instructive because they do identify what we would do if if situations got bad enough, and the technology exists, and we have continued to perfect it over time. I would argue what Shell is doing at the Pearl um, G GTL plant is different than what the Nazis were doing in World War II out of necessity. But we have an even more recent example, which I think is very instructive as to what, quote unquote, we would do if your predictions um, in the Shell patch and in the US do pan out. And it's the European energy crisis of 21 and 22. And, and what did they do? Uh, they scoured the world for every molecule of uh, energy they could get their hands on, regardless of carbon footprint, regardless of uh, price, and regardless of impact on emerging markets. And in fact, Germany retreated to using coal on a massive scale to buttress the worst impacts, to shave the worst risks off um, the energy crisis. And I think the U.S. would do much the same. I think the U.S. would limit exports of all manner of, of refined products and LNG. I think uh, we would quickly ramp back up coal production. Uh, and the use of coal to produce electricity to offset um, natural gas that would be uh, otherwise used for those efforts. I think um, this gets to the second category of why we think the repertoire of responses available to humanity um, to the development of a temporary period of relative energy shortage um, would involve a wiping away of politics. Look, there's strong support for coal in the U.S. There's huge controversy about its phase out, even if it's being replaced with natural gas. And I think a lot of that would get wiped away if we did see $200, $250 oil and the inevitable recession that would, that would follow. Um, and so I think 
the, the European example, and look, this is Germany, you know, the, the, the global capital of the green energy transition, because of one year's worth of crisis, where oil leaped to $130 a barrel, roughly, but most importantly, natural gas hit unbelievable numbers, tenfold type numbers, like Adam um, explained earlier, is possible. Uh, $100 per million BTU natural gas in Europe, intraday high uh, at the top, really remarkable. Um, what, what did they do? They, they suffered economically, and they still are, um, through their own, I think, idiotic policies, but they immediately wiped away political constraints to getting their hands on any hydrocarbon that would work. And as I think we both agree, it doesn't take but two to three million barrels either way to swing the market violently from negative $27 a barrel to $130 a barrel, like we saw in the post-COVID, um, uh, during the COVID emergency and, 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 the, and the era that followed. And so I, I think there are things we should we would do. We wouldn't need to do them at scale. Um, if we did 5 million barrels a day of GTL, that would probably buy us a decade. You know. I've had, if we got serious about developing all the conventional resources, like I talked about earlier, that really are just inherently constrained by politics, I think $200 a barrel oil would, would wipe away those political constraints. And so um, humans have an amazing way to regress to the mean. And um, the, the production of energy resources like oil and natural gas and, and NGLs and condensates and even coal is, is an upward sloping uh, curve with a bit of a sine wave to it. Well, look, I, you know, I, I, I think... Again, on, on so many of these details, I, I, I agree totally, but I, I guess in some it's the perspective and it's the conclusion um, that, that I reach is a little bit different. So, you know, if oil prices went to $200 and the United States feared um, a normalization of its U.S. gas price, natural gas price with world prices, which then subjected an export ban on LNG leading to effectively a pretty tough spot for most NATO countries who have come to rely on a U.S. LNG backstop to help offset Russian production, thereby exporting what we're seeing here in the United States to the rest of the world. I I would call that pretty pessimistic and, and kind of in my vein of what I would worry about for an energy crisis in the next five years. So if coming out of the back of that, we end up with low energy prices again, um, I don't know that I would consider that a, a, de a defeat on, on my, you know, if we're making our hypothetical Matt Simmons style bet, particularly because as you and I will find something else to agree on, when we go down the path and we look ultimately 20 and 30 years out, I think we both agree on the unbelievable high efficiency and low carbon footprint of nuclear, nuclear power and uranium. And, and so I think we all know where we need to get eventually. And that's why ultimately I'm, I am quite optimistic and bullish long term. I think our best days do lie ahead of us because if you look through human history, there was two major inflection points in human history and both of them corresponded to a step change in energy efficiency. The first is when we went from sort of hunting and gathering to domesticated farm life. And that was commensurate, give or take a couple thousand years with the written word and civilization as we know it. And then the second was civilization was basically static for the next three plus thousand years uh, until we move from that grain-based diet and using animal locomotion um, to burning coal and using fossil fuels. And we went from an EROI of five to one to 30 to one. Well, with nuclear, we could go to 101 or 180 to one on some of the new SMRs. And so I think that really, you know, I'm, I'm hyper bullish if, if you really kind of coax me out of it in, in the long term, because I think that what this energy crisis is beginning to elicit is a proper appreciation for the benefits of nuclear power. And if that's what comes of all this, and if you chalk up renewables and EVs and a lot of the nonsense that we've had in the last 10 years to the cost of doing business to ultimately getting us to a nuclear future, then I think it's all well worth it. And I do think that sort of the, the best, most, most prolific days lie ahead. Adam, can I ask a question on that? Because this is where I was going to get to around sort of your demand outlook. Um, it, uh, what, what is your general, what kind of probability do you put on um, advances in other forms of energy that may reduce the world's need for, for fossil fuels going forward? So let's say we go into a nuclear renaissance yep. um, and we do end up electrifying a much greater percentage of the transportation uh, system. Um, so we just need fewer fossil fuels to power it going forward. Will that, ascent, could, could that essentially push off your concerns about peak cheap oil until the next hundred years. 
Well, look, so so let me take a, a big step back because this could fill a whole podcast in and of itself. And I want to be concise. I want to let Doomberg have some time and I want to be able to talk about some other things here as well that you find in, interesting and, and germane. So we look at everything through the lens of EROI or energy return on investment. How much energy do you get out for every unit you put in? And all of human history has been a massive unidirectional push towards things that have higher and higher and higher EROIs. We started out, as I mentioned, hunting and gathering. Then we dealt with grain-based, you know, domesticated crops and farm life. And then we moved to coal and then ultimately to oil, natural gas. And then finally to nuclear power in uh, the, the second half of last uh, century. We can't move towards something that has inferior energetics. Renewables have inferior energetics. We're never going to move towards them. That's why this push has been so painful. If they were really much more efficient, we would have readily adopted them. If the windmill was the answer to our problems, it would have been adopted when Don Quixote was fighting the windmills. It would not have to be in 2000. And 24, such as it is, and it's still a painful experience because the energetics don't work. The only thing where the energetics do work is nuclear. Nuclear is off the charts. Everything else in in the thermal, when you're looking at, um, you know, if, when you're looking at chemical energy and releasing energy by by breaking bonds of hydrocarbons or anything else for that matter, um, the only thing that beats that is nuclear power. So if we can go down the nuclear road, you can electrify anything you want. You know, the EV, by the time you build its battery and you power it with renewables, doesn't make a lick of sense. It's terrible energy efficiency. It emits more CO2 than if you just burnt the gasoline in the first place. If we want to go to an all nuclear world, you have at it. You know, that is by far the most efficient and cleanest, but the most efficient, most importantly, form of energy we've ever come to know. And you can do dumb things with it. You know, you could have nuclear power plants that made hydrogen to run in airplanes if you really wanted to. So, yeah, if we move to 100% of a nuclear world, um, then I think that you could conceivably begin to wean yourself off of fossil fuels and hydrocarbons. Uh, and I would frankly be the first in line to buy a ticket to see that show because I think it would be just fabulous. So 100% agreement, obviously, uh, on our part. Uh, everything Adam just said, we would wholeheartedly agree on and would um, we would stand in line right behind him to buy that ticket. I will just have one nuance to that statement, which is even in that scenario, all primary energy production is additive, and we would still produce more oil, more natural gas, and more coal, more 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 coal um, than we do today, uh, because not all of the world is ready to receive and operate nuclear power facilities. They are very sophisticated to build, operate, and maintain safely, um, and we don't necessarily want all the world to be in possession of this technology uh, for national security concerns. But all the world does want to develop. And your standard of living is defined by how much energy you get to harvest. And in a world where the West, the US, G7, G20 countries have um, proliferated nuclear power uh, to the extent that both Adam and I wish they would, um, there's five to six billion people who would greedily, happily, readily consume the incremental barrel of oil, natural gas, and ton of coal thus freed up. And I think even if you look at the renewables contribution as inefficient and uneconomic as they are, the, the arc of history is the total primary energy consumed by humans always goes up. There's an infinite demand for private energy at reasonable prices. And in a world where we did you know, um, proliferate nuclear power, that would have a temporary dampening effect on the price of oil, gas, and coal, which would then create new demand for it in the developing world who are desperate to raise their standard of living to something we would consider even recognizable. Yeah, I think I think that's a wonderful point. And, and, and I think that, you know, it gets to this idea of what is energy and its relationship with the economy. I mean, to me, energy is the economy. There's nothing that we do in our world that doesn't use energy to transform some material from one form to another or move some good someplace to another or move some person some place to another. So the entire system that we live in is nothing but a giant energy conversion apparatus and machine. And to the same extent that there's no upper bound on where we would accept per capita GDP, we would always take more. I think that there's absolutely no upper bound. So you're probably right. You know, if you had almost unlimited, you know, incredibly efficient energy coming from nuclear power, you probably would consume that and the oil and the coal and the gas, um, you know, up until up until um, you exhausted all. So you, you're, you're probably right about that. Obviously, the other thing being, you know, I was being a little bit facetious. I said, you know, if the world all goes 100% nuclear, then you could get rid of hydrocarbons and get rid of your cars. Uh, I mean, you know, I think if you did not invest in oil and gas on the 
hypothesis that we were going to go 100% nuclear and drive electric vehicles on 100% nuclear um, power load, uh, you, you would miss quite a bit of a uh, of of a investment cycle uh, in between. So so obviously I say that a little bit tongue in cheek. Yeah. All right. Well, look, we're we're coming up on the hour mark here, um, gentlemen. I will go as long as you want to go here, and I want to make sure we talk about whatever topics are important to you that we haven't yet. I'm going to ask maybe my last major question and let you guys just drive how you want to wrap this up um, or, or where you want to take it before we wrap it up. Um, but if I can, I, I just want to get to your your outlooks for supply going forward. Um, Doomberg, you know, if, if, if I sort of understand your perspective well, it's that there are a couple factors that you factor into, you know, why supply could go up in the future. Um, one is, you know, you talk about expanding sort of our definition of, of what the oil feedstock is. Um, and obviously new technologies will continue to help play a role in, in expanding that and accelerating that. The second is that uh, <clears throat> there's the potential to for new development and potentially, you know, hopefully new discoveries of energy deposits around the world. We haven't really talked about all that much yet in this conversation. And then the third is um, we get to a point that you made in our discussion earlier, Doomberg, that it's it's much easier to remove a political constraint than a geological constraint, and that there's lots of oil out there that we know of that we're just not tapping yet for a whole host of different political or geopolitical reasons. And in a crisis, if I understand your logic correctly, you think that we'll become much more amenable uh, to tapping those those resources um, so we could we could potentially, you know, sort of change the availability game and supply pretty quickly if we all of a sudden say the world got together and said, hey, let's help Venezuela really, really tap their resources. It's just one example. Um, so if maybe Doomberg, we could start with you with uh, A, did I did I summarize that well? And, and B, just going to give it a, a sense of your outlook here, because I, I want to I want to see if you guys agree that there is indeed enough oil that could come out of the ground here if we do these things right. Um, or if you actually have difference of opinions on actually how much oil is out there to tap going forward. So I, I would say, first of all, thank you. It's been a, a wonderful discussion, um, a real honor to be invited to participate in it. And you have uh, mostly accurately reflected our view. I would add the following. Um, we often say, and I think Adam would agree with this, that the single most important question you have to ask yourself about whatever economy that you're analyzing is, is that economy currently in a period of relative energy abundance or deficit? And the answer to that question drives significant influences on the answer to all other questions about the economy, because I agree with Adam that ultimately GDP is just an expression of how much energy you are producing and how efficiently you are translating that energy into increased standard of living. Um, to the sort of descriptor of, of what we would do if we were to pivot from what I, I believe today is a period of relative energy abundance. I mean, I think it's pretty undeniable with you know, natural gas in the US at two and change and LNG at eight and a half and coal at 125 and oil in the low 70s, despite all of the geopolitical risk premium that's undoubtedly baked into those prices, that the world is, is at worst balanced, but most likely uh, in a period of relative energy abundance. If we pivot to a temporary period of energy deficit, the cost curve of implementation options include all manner of things, including developing resources that we know exist that are trapped by politics, including putting in a ceiling on the equilibrium price of oil by building out all different manner of ways to um, use natural gas around the world um, to uh, substitute either directly or indirectly for the reasons we use oil. And then the last point I'd make that we haven't talked about yet, um, you know, as we alluded to heading into the 2010s, nobody would have had the impact of shale on the horizon. And it's an interesting question sitting here today. Um, what could that be in the next 10 years? And we would argue one possibility is we're leaving this most recent energy crisis with a far more efficient global supply chain network for the exploration, exploitation, and use of natural gas. We're, we're in, in two to three years, we're going to be able to ship natural gas to and from far-flung places around the globe that would have seemed inconceivable before the European energy crisis. And as Adam correctly said, I'm old enough to remember when Freeport LNG was an import terminal and how quickly have we turned the tables? And we would argue that we would be just as quick at turning the tables 
in the face of an energy crisis. So to your question, we are currently uh, in a period of relative energy abundance. If that were to change, there's a menu of options with a cost associated with each of those options and a thickness of the wedge that could temporarily bridge the gap until the next technology miracle inevitably comes around the corner. And I don't know if it's from the proliferation of AI uh, across the oil majors or you know some political, um, you know, the great reset uh, uh, after the fourth turning leads to a world that collaborates far more efficiently with less friction on energy. And so who knows? Um, but it is always and forever the direction of the world that we produce more primary energy and we exploit it uh, for the betterment of humanity. And I choose to live in a world where that continues. Great. Well, Doomberg, uh, I, I think that we should have a Neil Howe fourth turning podcast on a regular basis because I think we would uh, we, we might either do well by that or we would <laughs> quickly have you fall from number one down to number <laughs> something else. But um, I, I'm glad I'm glad to see uh, you're, you're, you're a big fourth turning fan as well as, as are we here at GNR. Um, so, look, I, I think that the biggest single event that's happened to global energy markets in the last arguably 100 years and certainly in the last 20 years has been the unexpected introduction of nearly you know 13 million barrels a day of straight straight crude and if you add in ngls and if you add in just straight natural gas you're talking about probably close to 30 to 40 million barrels of oil equivalent when it's all said and done you know, unbelievable volumes uh, of unexpected oil and natural gas that we uh, made available. It's not that we discovered it. We always knew it was there, but we made it available. And if you don't think that that is the, or has been the seminal event of the last 20 years in the energy markets, you, you're living under a rock. I don't know what to tell you. Um, we believe based on the geological properties of the shales, based on how much total resource and recoverable reserve is in each of these shales. And I should point out, we have tools and analyses that I don't think anyone else has. You know, we uh, have developed our own neural networks, talked about AI. We've been developing neural networks here for seven or eight years to try to assess shale qualities, to try to assess the production profiles of each individual well in the shale, and ultimately to try to get at a number of how much reserve is in that shale to determine when half of that has been produced and when we think production could roll over. And, and I don't know anybody else that's working on this type of stuff, mainly probably because it's very technical, but also because with energy at 3.8% of the S&P versus 15% historically, you've, you've decimated investment houses. You've decimated uh, sell-side research. You've decimated buy-side guys. No one is doing this type of work anymore, or very, very, very few people with any type of a historical context. So, But we have the tools. Maybe we'll be right. Maybe we'll be wrong. We have high degree of confidence that we'll be right. And what those models are all pointing to is the fact that now most of the shales, the Barnett, the Fayetteville, the Eagle for the Bakken, have already peaked and rolled over. And that the two big ones driving supply thus far, the Permian on the oil side and the Marcellus on the gas side, are set to roll over in 2024. And if you look at the beginning of this year, January of this year, year on year growth in the Permian was like six, 700,000 barrels a day. It's 40,000 barrels a day as at the last reading. This growth on a year on year basis has slowed to nearly zero. It's about to turn negative. And if you don't think that the biggest source of production rolling over is going to have as big an impact as when it ramped up, uh, I think you're going to be uh, in for a little bit of a shock. So do I think we can resolve out of this eventually? I do. Do I see exactly what path that's going to take? Of course not. Uh, however, I think that in 2024 and beyond, the idea that you've had this major seminal once in a century almost move in terms of bringing on new production this quickly, now turning from a tailwind to a headwind, it has to be taken into account. It has to be monitored very, very closely. And I think, frankly, it has to be uh, invested in. And the one thing that I would caution is this idea that the next shale, whether it literally means the next shale on an international basis or the next shale style technology improvement is right around the corner, um, that, that's, that's a tough prediction. Uh, of course, the answer is maybe. Uh, however, I would caution against banking our hopes on a s equilibrium or even 
oversupplied market on the fact that we're going to pull another rabbit out of the hat the way we did with the shales. The shales were really, really unique in a lot of ways. We knew where they were. We needed a way to extract them. We figured out that way. And then we had this big whoosh as new supply came online. Look at the copper industry, just to give you a quick analogy. They did this in the 1990s with something called solvent extraction electro winnowing, new technology. It boosted copper supply by 20% over two or three years, maybe four or five years. Not, not dissimilar to what we're talking about with shale, right? We're talking about bringing on 20 million barrels on a 100 million barrel market in the same ballpark. It depressed prices for nearly a decade, and then it peaked, rolled over, and ran out. And now copper prices, instead of being 45, 50 cents, or, you know, 10 times multiple of that. That's what I worry is happening here. We had this big shock to the system. I don't know where the next one's coming. Maybe it will, but maybe it won't. And as of now, I don't see evidence that, that we have that around the corner. Adam, uh, first off, thank you so much for sharing the forecasts, sobering as they are, from your proprietary model there about uh, the, the production from the shale. Let me just ask one question I think might be on viewers' minds here, which is, you know, again, most of the shale that we've talked about, so the shale supply we've talked about so far in this discussion have been US-based. And so I think a regular person might say, okay, well, I mean, aren't there other shale fields around the rest of the world that we can go after now that we have the technology pretty much refined? It seems like you think that is not a slam dunk or wouldn't be necessarily easy or fast. Why? So about 10 years ago, we asked ourselves the same question. And, and the reason we asked ourselves this question was that the answers that people were putting forward, we felt to be largely unsatisfactory. Most people were saying, well, the U.S. has special uh, land mineral laws, different from anywhere else. And that means that we can do shale here, but not internationally because we own our minerals privately. Uh, other people were saying, well, we have we have the pumping pressure uh, pressure pumping uh, equipment here in the U.S. We don't have it anywhere else, and so we can't do it elsewhere. And to me, I thought that was all complete nonsense. I mean, mm -hmm. you could have made the same case for conventional oil drilling. You know, when after Colonel Drake struck oil in Pennsylvania, you could have said, well, you can't do that in the Middle East. They don't have any rigs out there. Sure enough, you know, we brought the rigs out there, and I, I was convinced that the same would be true here. What was more uh, predictive when looking at the energy markets was instead the geology, the endowment. Do you have major oil fields in other parts of the world? Do you have major shale basins in other parts of the world? And so we tried to put that together. We put together a model. The USGS has a lot of the data. It's just compiled very poorly. We put it together uh, in a way that we found was usable. We spoke to shale industry experts and said, look, if you had to design a shale from the ground up, what would its geological qualities be? Things like thickness and thermal maturity and seismicity, uh, organic content, clay content, all these different things, permeability, porosity, um, temperature as well. And so all these different things we put into the matrix and we said, okay, look, you know, how do the U.S. shales rank and how do the rest of the world shales rank? And the U.S. shales of the 10 best, the U.S. were the seven, seven of the 10 best. Um, it seems unfair. You know, there's sort of this sense, well, how could all of the shale be in the U.S.? The, obviously, you're, you're kind of looking at it wrong. But the truth of the matter is that resource endowment on a global basis is not uniform. It averages to something, but it's not a uniform average. South Africa has the gold mines. Uh, Russia has the PGM deposits. Uh, Canada has the diamond uh, kimberlite deposits. The United States has the shale deposits. It has to do with the fact that most of the continent used to be this quiet inland sea. It was the perfect depositional environment. It was quiet. It allowed for very thick sand packages. It had very low clay, very high silica, all these things that made for a perfect shale. Where are the other ones? Well, one's in Argentina, one's in Colombia, one's in Russia. The Argentina is the Vaca Muerte. I would watch that very closely. Um, you know, YPF just suffered another... Uh, uh, unforced or self-imposed self-enforced error uh, just the other day with its privatization uh, efforts so you know again it's not looking like that's coming on anytime soon uh colombia has a moratorium on shale production and russia has a triple mint sanction on sharing western shale technologies with russia uh that wasn't true in place for the last 15 years. Whenever you know the Obama administration took off the Russian sanctions or amended things, it was never on the table to even discuss the sanctions pertaining to Western shale technologies into Russia. So is that something that can be removed one day? It's totally possible. Is it something that they can do uh, themselves and ultimately develop that industry themselves? Certainly not on the timeline that we would need to avert a near-term energy crisis, but medium-term and long-term possible. Something to watch very, very closely. Uh, it is the, that would be the mother of all shales. That would be like another 
Permian Basin that comes online. The question is, I suppose, has depletion taken hold by that point to the point where we need another Permian Basin? Uh, time, time will tell. All right. Well, gentlemen, before we get to concluding remarks, um, I just want to make sure there's there aren't any remaining key points that you wanted to raise in this discussion that I, I haven't had the foresight to do so yet. Um, Doomberg, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, no, I, I, I would say I very much enjoyed it. And uh, even to what Adam just said, you know, um, I think if those scenarios came to pass, I would argue they don't necessarily mark peak cheap oil. They mark a temporary energy crisis that would quickly resolve. For example, the Chinese could steal our technology and give it to the Russians uh, if things got bad enough. And frankly, it's not like we don't have a long enough track record of that happening. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just want to say that I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I think conversations like this where people respect each other and politely uh, articulate um, their views are far too rare in the clickbait driven social media world that we all live in. And so I, for one, am very thrilled to have been a participant of it. Um, I, I read the GNR team stuff every time it comes out and I certainly uh, are mindful that they do the same with us. And, and, and you, Adam, of course, are a gentleman of the highest order. And so it's really fantastic and, and proud to have been part of it. Well, thank you. Mr. Rosenzweig? No, I, I, I had a wonderful time as well. We really respect your work. I'm glad to see we agree on more than we disagree on. Please take me up uh, on, on our fourth turning podcast idea. I think we could easily <laughs> fill an hour once a week and uh, leave everyone depressed and also wanting more. Um, I think that human ingenuity is wonderful. I think our best days do lie ahead, but I think we're in an awful lot of trouble here, mainly because, you know, we haven't spent enough money in the last 15 years uh, on our energy supply. And, and Doomberg, I, I thank you for putting out some of the really insightful analysis that you do, um, even the ones that we don't agree with. I think you add a lot to the discourse of the global energy market at a time when there's not a lot of people um, that, that are left doing this. So uh, more power to you. Uh, continue to read your stuff. And thank you so much, Adam, for having us both here. And I thought it was great. Well, it's it's such a joy uh, to be able to to host discussions like this, um, these respectful co-explorations rather than you know heated debates. Um, I think our, our as Doomberg said, way too rare. I appreciate you uh, too for doing this in in such a gentlemanly, uh, scholarly way. I think folks have learned an awful lot through this conversation. Um, both of you are welcome back on this platform anytime you like, together, individually. If you haven't gotten that fourth turning podcast uh, up and running, but you want to do a trial run, please do it here. Um, as we wrap up here, folks, um, I, I, I do want to give both of you a chance to let folks know uh, if, if they've you know, really enjoyed your commentary, would like to follow you and your work, where they should go. Doomberg, why don't we start with you? Yeah, very simple. Everything we do is at doomberg.substack.com. Um, our participation on their notes platform, which is a Twitter variant, if you like. Um, all of our monthly pieces are pro tier, where we do a, a monthly presentation to our um, uh, premium subscribers. Our podcast appearances, like this one, will be linked there under our Doomcast um, webpage. And so you can find everything we do at doomberg.substack.com. We are 100% subscriber supported. Uh, it's truly the work of, of our lives, and we're having a blast doing it. Fantastic. And, uh, and Adam? Yeah, you can find us at uh, Gehring and Rosenswag. Uh, on, on, if you get anywhere close to spelling it right, Google will, will point you in the right direction. But our website is gorosen, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N.com. We post all of our quarterly letters and all of our podcasts and everything like that. And, and I'll just say, you know, in, in the spirit of, of respectful dialogue, the one thing I might, I might ask, just a little, little minor nit here is Doomberg, could you put a tie on next time when, when, when we talk like this, just in the question of <laughs> I'll respect. put a tie on when Adam does. Yeah. All right. Fair. <laughs> there we go. That might be a while guys. Um, all right. Well, look, thanks so much folks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, um, please let the participants here know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And if you enjoy uh, deep dive interviews like these, um, want to follow more of the ones we do here at Thoughtful Money, feel free to go to my Substack. That's at adamtaggart.substack.com. Uh, Adam Rosenzweig, Doombarg, uh, again, just been a, a delight, a pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody else. Thanks so much for watching.